All right, uh, I think we can go ahead and begin. Uh, are there any questions from last time? We ended with Stein Springs dilation, which I went through extremely quickly, but it was just more to give you a sketch. Uh, but any, uh, any questions? Actually, I wanna add one thing to Stein Spring dilation theorem, uh, which is sometimes added. Um, and that is, so what do we start with? We started with a C star algebra A and a, a UCP map um, B from A and B of H. Well, the remark I'll add is that uh, if A maps into a smaller von Neumann algebra than B of H, well, then you also have operators on B of H which commute with the image of A. And the remark I'll make, this was first observed by Arverson, is that you can also get a representation of those operators on this K. So this is maybe uh, something I'll note because I, I might want to use it later. So the remark. So this was first noticed by Arvison. And that is that, um, so here again, a, a uh, unital C star algebra and phi a UCP map from A to B of H UCP. Uh, so then, not only does there exist a Steinspring dilation, but uh, there exists a representation of the commutant of the image of A on this. So then there exists an isometry. Well, there exists Hilbert space K, an isometry V mapping H to K. A, a representation, a star representation, pi mapping A to B of K, and a star representation, uh, say pi prime mapping the commutant of the range of A to the commutant of A inside of B of K. Uh, uh, there exists this representation. No. Uh, and again, such that V of A is V star 5A V for all A and A. And pi prime of T V is equal to V T for all T in V of A. And this is even a normal star representation. And why is this? So this is like a strengthened Stein Springs theorem, but it's really not any different proof. Uh, the reason why this is the case is because if you go back to how we proved Stein Springs theorem, this is on this page right here. So this is the sketch I gave. And that is that our new Hilbert space K is some completion of the algebraic tensor product of A with H uh, with this inner product here. And, uh, and so you can just define the representation there. So uh, we just, so how do we do this? We define. One question. Sure. That pi is the same as, there are two pi's. Uh, yeah, well, there's a pi and a pi prime. Maybe, maybe let me change this to rho to uh, distinguish it. Uh, rho. Yeah, does that look better? Mm. That way there's no confusion. Uh, so we define rho from the commutant of A to this commutant, oh, and this should be a pi of A since it's the image in, I guess, to be precise. So we define rho from this commutant to the other commutant uh, by rho of t 
Uh, I'll just tell you what it does to elementary tensors, and then you have to show that it extends linearly, etc. Uh, so this is a typical elementary tensor is going to be A tensor C, where A is an A and C is an H. And you just define this to be A tensor TC. And then the only thing you have to check is you have to check that this does give you a well-defined uh, map. And the whole, the whole reason why that works is just note that if you look at row of T um, of like A tensor C with B tensor eta, and you take this inner product, well, by definition, this is uh, the inner product of phi with B star A T C uh, eta. And, uh, and so you see, oh, I wanted to look at the norm of this. Here. So I claim that this is, uh, well, okay, there were two claims. Hold on, now I'm, let me keep this back here. Uh, so the observation is T commutes with this thing. So we could rewrite this as T phi, or move T to the other side even. So then as rewrite this as phi B star A C T star eta. And so here we see that this is equal to now A tensor C, uh, B, uh, and now we have rho, rho T star B tensor C. Uh, what was my whole point in doing this? Is that if you also put in here like a pi of X, now you get an X right there, you get an X right there, and you get a uh, pi of X right here. Uh, no, you can move the X with the B, that's my point. So you can rewrite this as A and then X star B, which you can now bring the row and the pi to the other side and rewrite this as pi of X rho of T a tensor C, B tensor C. Right, so you see you move pi of T times, or rho of T times pi of X becomes pi of X times rho of T. Uh, so we see that indeed, uh, so therefore rho of T uh, does indeed live in the commutant of pi of A intersect, okay. Um, and then you also have to check that this is, does give a well-defined bounded operator, but that's easy to do. In fact, if you take T to be a unitary, then it's pretty easy to see that this preserves this inner product, uh, and hence rho of, t, rho of T would be a unitary. Since every operator is a sum of unit, a span of unitaries, that, that shows you that you do get this, uh, you do get a bounded operator with rho of T. And you can check pretty easily that it's a star homomorphism. Uh, and what else? The only other thing to observe is that if you look at V, if you look at rho of T times V, and we can do this just on elementary tensors, uh, so maybe V of C, that this is exactly uh, rho of T times one tensor C which is one tensor TC, which is V T C. So you see that since it's true for all vectors, therefore rho of T V is equal to V T. Okay, so that shows that equality. Uh, so this is just uh, an extension of Steinspring's theorem that just says you can carry the commutant uh, along with the representation of A. Uh, this isn't used as much usually when people use uh, Steinspring. Uh, they just use what I wrote here on this page, but uh, this is good to keep in mind. It comes in handy. All right, so that's uh, what I want to say about Steinspring's theorem. Um, now I want to talk about 
our sure multipliers. Uh, so specifically, you know, so now here we are. Um, Uh, let's see, what do we leave off before Stein Spring? Uh, we introduce completely positive maps. Okay, so this is what I want to do next. Uh, so uh, if uh, S is a set, this is a set, and K maps S times S to the complex numbers, so then the sure multiplier uh, is what we'll denote by mk. And this is going to map bounded operators on L2 of s to bounded operators on L2 of s. And how are we going to do this? Well, uh, bounded operators on L2 of a set, we can think of these as S by S matrices uh, over the set. So if S is just the numbers one through N, and this is exactly N by N matrices. Um, so the, the fact that we have a set gives us a distinguished basis. And so we have these matrices. Uh, so what, I, what the multiplier is going to do is it's just going to multiply uh, one of these bounded operators. When we think of it as a matrix, it's just going to multiply it by making a new matrix where the ijth entry is just multiplied by k, right? So specifically, we the sure multiplier is this map uh, given by m k. So if we have some t, this is going to be some. Well, t is going to be a matrix. Let me write it as a matrix. So it's going to be some x uh, s t. And this is going to be a new matrix whose entries are exactly just K, S, T, X, S, T. Right. Uh, so that's uh, what a sure multiplier is. Now, a sure multiplier may or may not exist, of course, uh, and a, a, what's easy to see as needed is that K should be a bounded function. Um, but even if it's a bounded function, uh, there's no reason why this matrix that you've defined here actually represents a bounded operator. Uh, so bounded operators all give you matrices like this, uh, but all, not all matrices give you bounded operators. Um, so we'll say it's a sure multiplier if it actually is a bounded operator. So sure multipliers, so if if this is well defined. So that's what a sure multiplier is. Um, OK, so we're going to, we'll study sure multipliers in, in detail a little bit later in the course. Uh, but for now, I want to do one special case, and that is multipliers of positive type. So the theorem I want to prove is the following. So again, S a set and K mapping S times S to the complex numbers. Uh, and let me assume that the diagonal entries are all equal to one. All right, so then the theorem is that, um, that K is of positive type. if and only if the sure multiplier m sub k, um, again, mapping d of l to of s to itself, uh, is uh, UCP. So in particular, it exists, and it's a unital completely positive map. Uh, so this is what I want to do next. So let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so there are two directions to prove. Let's first prove maybe this direction. So we'll assume k is of positive type, and we'll show that the multiplier is does exist since UCP. Uh, to this, we'll use the fact that positive type, so k positive type, implies that there exists a Hilbert space 
say h and some function c mapping s uh, to h such that uh, c or uh, such that uh, k of st is equal to uh, the inner product of cs with ct. And that was one characterization we showed for uh, positive type kernels. Well, notice that I chose uh, the diagonal to be equal to one, which means that these, uh, this map C is a unit vector at each entry. So that's why I did that. So we'll go ahead and define V uh, sub C, let's call it. So this is gonna map L2 of S to L2 of S tensor H. Uh, so by V C of delta S, is equal to delta s tensor cs and then you extend linearly and i'm only telling you what it does on the basis vectors but uh, of course you can see these uh, are orthogonal vectors and they get sent to orthogonal vectors in the tensor product and so this will extend and these are uh, of the same unit so this will extend to an isometry so in fact vc is then an isometry. Uh, and what can we, uh, what do we notice? Uh, the claim is just that we can view the multiplier. Uh, so this actually gives us the GNS or the Stein spring dilation. Uh, so we can check that the multiplier m sub k of an operator x is exactly VC saw, uh, and then here we have X tensor the identity, and then we have VC. So this is what I claim. Uh, so let's so let's write it up as a claim, and so then let's just uh, go ahead and check this. So we need to see. Uh, so this thing on the right is clearly UCP because it comes from you know it has this dilation. Uh, it's defined by this dilation, um, uh, this time spring representation. Uh, so let's go ahead and just verify this equality. Uh, so to do that, we just check what are the, what matrix does this represent on the right here? And so we want to compute, uh, when we compute what this matrix is, uh, the matrix entries are obtained by just taking the inner product with Dirac functions. So we compute, so indeed, V, C, star, X, tensor one, V, C, and then we take this with uh, the Dirac function at Y times the Dirac function at X, or what was I doing for matrices? S and T, so let's do Dirac function at T times the Dirac function at S. So we just compute this and then we see what this is. And this is exactly um, X uh, tensor one, uh, X tensor one of delta T tensor CT. And here we have delta S tensor CS. And now uh, we have just elementary tensors here. So this is going to be the inner product of CT with CS and times the inner product of X delta T delta S. And this by hypothesis was B of TS. And now we have uh, X and we'll put that inside and delta T S. And so we see uh, exactly what we get. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, we get the equality we want. This, the TS coefficient of this operator is exactly the TS coefficient of this operator. And this is just exactly, and uh, oh, I changed K to phi. This is K 
I usually use phi for positive types, so maybe I should have done that in the beginning at all. And k of x delta t delta x. All right, so that gives the equality that we're looking for, since this is true for all t and s. Uh, so that's one direction. So now the other direction. So now we want to suppose that the, the Schur multiplier exists and is UCP. And then we want to uh, show that our kernel was of positive type. Uh, so what can we do there? Uh, so there we can just notice um, that uh, if E and S is a finite subset, Uh, so then, uh, let's look at this matrix, this matrix which is, has entries k, uh, um, uh, k uh, yeah, k T S uh, T S here, and then uh, the thing to notice is that this is exactly the matrix which is the sure multiplier corresponding to K of this uh, matrix which is just the characteristic function on E times E. Uh, I think this is what I want to say. Uh, yeah, uh, which this is a positive operator. And so therefore this is a positive operator. So this is a non-negative definite matrix. And this was how we defined K to be a positive type function is that all of these matrices were non-negative definite. So we get that therefore K is positive type. All right, which proves the other direction here. All right, any questions about this? So notice that the characteristic function on E times E, uh, so this is a positive operator. Uh, if you want one way to see it is because it's this, you take this operator right here, you this vector uh, times its adjoint. So where these are indexed by E. So this is equal to which we think of as a matrix, right? So it's some something adjoint times something. So it's, so it's maybe why you see that that operator is a non-negative one. Uh, okay. Wait, can you explain again why is this uh, characteristic function of e times e? Yeah. So here, like uh, this operator, operator, this operator right here. This is the operator. So this is in if you like, it's uh, matrices um, uh, from E to a singleton mm -hmm. with complex entries. And so this is, let's call this T, or, or let maybe call this T star, and then this one is T. So you have T star T, which is always non negative. Okay. Right, you can think of this, so this again, you can identify since E is finite, this is really isomorphic uh, to bounded operators from the scalars to L2. Okay, any other questions about that? All right. Um, All 
All right, so good. Next, next thing I want to do is, uh, so this was for sure multipliers. So this is when we had no group, uh, but if we're interested in groups, then we're going to be interested in um, maybe positive type functions on groups. And there we have the following thing. So if gamma, uh, if gamma is a group and now let me use phi, maybe since it's groups, uh, phi maps gamma to the complex numbers uh, is say bounded. So then the Hertz sure multiplier is denoted by M sub phi. So I'll use the same notation. Uh, and this is going to map the reduced group C star algebra to itself uh, is such that is this such that M sub phi of lambda t, where lambda is where these canonical unitaries in here, is equal to phi of t lambda t. And this is for all t and gamma. And again, this is uh, need not exist for all functions. Uh, so we say, oh, excuse me, not for children. This is a multiplier if uh, this is the case. Um, so then we call this a multiplier of the group. Um, and again, not every, not every function gives us a multiplier. Um, so it's only when this is a bounded operator, when this is a bounded map, that this is a multiplier, that the multiplier exists. Um, okay, so now we have the following theorem. So uh, it's, a, it's called a Hertz-Schur multiplier if it's actually completely bounded, but we haven't actually introduced completely bounded maps yet, so let me not delve on that. Uh, so the theorem is, is following. So um, again, phi mapping gamma, to the complex numbers, say bounded. Um, maybe let me make my life easier by asking that it sends the identity to one, this normalization. Uh, so then the following are equivalent. One is that phi is of positive type. Two is that M sub phi uh, is a multiplier and it's completely positive, is unital completely positive. So again, M sub phi mapping the reduced group C star algebra to itself. Is UCP. And the third is that uh, M sub phi extends to a normal map on the von Neumann algebra. L gamma to L gamma uh, is, um, is also UCP, unital completely positive. So not only do, does the multiplier define a map from the reduced group C star algebra to the reduced group C star algebra, but it has a continuous, so this is normal UCP and normal. Uh, it has a normal extension to the group von Neumann algebra, which uh, again, the group von Neumann algebra is, um, uh, my, it's just generated, it's the weak. So this Seaster algebra is a subalgebra of B of L2, and the von Neumann algebra is the strong operator topology closure of the reduced group Seaster algebra. Um, which is the same as the bicommutant by von Neumann. Uh, actually, we're going to need one. Uh, we're going to need one lemma maybe to prove this theorem, which maybe I'll go ahead and spend the time to prove here. So this is the theorem, but let me first prove this lemma. Um, which is that the group von Neumann algebra, so recall that so recall, uh, I know most of you have seen C star algebra before, at least the basic theory, but maybe some of you have not 
uh, worked with von Neumann algebras. So let me just recall that the group von Neumann algebra, so this was defined to be the bicommutant of the left regular representation. So this is a von Neumann subalgebra of L2 of gamma, and which by von Neumann's theorem, this is you take the span of this set, and this is a star algebra containing the identity. So you could just take the weak operator topology closure, or you took, could take the strong operator topology closure. Um, for convex sets, weak operator topology closure is the same as the strong operator topology closure. Uh, so these all define the same von Neumann algebra. That's the group von Neumann algebra. Uh, so this was defined by Murray and von Neumann. Uh, L here, I think, is supposed to mean left because you have a left regular representation, but you also have a right regular representation. But that's a bit unfortunate terminology. I, I, I like to think that L stands for Lebesgue. I think that's a much better uh, representation because uh, you know, we've already seen before that if gamma is an abelian group, then this via Fourier transform is naturally a smurf to L infinity of the dual group. Uh, which L and L infinity definitely stands for Lebesgue. So, um, so I like to think of the L here standing for Lebesgue. Uh, but there's also the right group von Neumann algebra, and here R definitely does stand for right, um, which is defined to be the bicommutant of the right regular representation. And the lemma that I want to prove is that um, uh, the lemma I want to prove is that, in fact, L gamma, it's the bicommutant to the left regular representation, but it's also the single commutant to the right regular representation. So this is the single commutant of the right regular representation. Uh, and uh, by symmetry, once you prove this, you also have that the right group on Neumann algebra is the commutant of the left, uh, left regular representation. So this is the lemma I want to prove, because uh, we'll, we'll need this in this theorem to go from three to one, I think. At least the proof I had in mind we did. Uh, so let me go ahead and give a proof of this lemma. Uh, so we have this set here, and we want to show that the set is equal. Uh, so I should remark that one containment uh, should be more or less obvious. And that is that the commuton to the right regular representation is a von Neumann algebra and certainly contains the unitaries from the left regular representation, and hence it contains the whole von Neumann algebra there. So note that uh, L gamma being contained in this is obvious uh, since. Um, uh, well, just since that the lambda t commutes with all of these things and L gamma um, uh, is the von Neumann algebra generated by the lambda t's, right? And L gamma is equal to this. So it's the von Neumann algebra generated by the lambda t's, and they're all contained in this von Neumann algebra, so it's certainly a von Neumann subalgebra there. So we just have to prove the reverse containment. That is, if you commute with the left regular, or if you commute with the right regular representation, then you actually commute with everything that commutes with the left regular representation. Okay. So, uh, so we need to show that if we have some t which commutes with all the operators coming from the right regular representation uh, and so then it should live in the group on our number so then it should commute with everything that commutes that so and if s is in the commutant of l gamma which we know is the same as the commutant of left regular representation 
So then we need to show that SMT commute. So then ST is equal to TS. All right, that's what, that's what we need to show. Um, right, so if T commutes with the right regular representation, then it commutes with everything that commutes with this. And so therefore uh, it lives in the bi which is L gamma. So this is what we need to prove. Uh, so how are we going to prove this? Uh, so we'll just take T and S arbitrary and these things. And then the first remark is, uh, so remark. So we don't know exactly what T looks like, uh, but we can apply T to our favorite vector. So how about, so let's not remark, but let's suppose, let's Suppose t times our favorite vector is the Dirac function at the identity. And let's give this, this is some vector in L2 of gamma, so let's write it out explicitly. Let's suppose that this is sum over t in gamma. Let's write out this coefficients explicitly like this. All right, so let's suppose that t times delta e has this representation, such a representation. So I want to compute then the representation of the adjoint of t. So how, how am I going to uh, do that? Uh, I'm just going to look at, uh, so then T times uh, delta, uh, say S delta E. Well, this is equal, well, I would really want T star here. So let me try this again. Uh, then delta S T star delta E is equal to T and then delta S is the right regular representation of S inverse applied to delta E, delta E. And now T commutes with the right regular representation. So I can rewrite this as T delta E and then move the right regular representation of the other side where it becomes rho S. And so that gives us delta S inverse. And so this is just when we plug in our representation here, we pick up uh, exactly the S inverse coefficient. Uh, so this is just alpha S inverse. So that's the coefficient. So that means that if we look at this vector T star delta E, uh, we have an explicit formula for its coefficients. So we get that T star delta E is going to equal exactly the sum over T and gamma. And the coefficients are gonna be the same as above, except they're just gonna be alpha T inverse. And then we're gonna have to take a conjugate because I have T star on the right here, so delta T. All right, so if we have a formula for the T applied to delta E, then we also have a formula for T star applied to delta E, which is just each coefficient is the, is the conjugate of the coefficient corresponding to the inverse. All right, and similarly, if S times delta E, is if it has some expansion, say, uh, let me use S instead, S and beta S delta S. Well, you can do this exact same argument, except instead of the row, you'll just use the lambda because S commutes with lambda. And so you get, uh, so then S star delta E, you have its formula for its expansion. This is S and gamma and it'll be exactly B S inverse and then delta S. So it's the same, same type of one. Uh, okay, so then what can we do? Well, now this, we can look at uh, T times S, apply this to delta E, and we can also look to S times T and apply them to delta E, and these two formulas will allow us to compute both sides. Uh, so I have to move on to the next page. So we get that therefore, if we look at the inner product, 
of ts dot e dot e. So this is the inner product of s delta e t star delta e. And now we have formulas for both the left and right side of this inner product. And so we can compute. This is just going to be the sum overall t and gamma. And we're going to pick up the uh, beta t. And then for the other side, we're going to get an alpha t inverse, uh, not conjugate. Well, the, we'll get conjugate twice. So we'll just get this. So here's, here's what we get for t times s times delta e. But on the other hand, just by a change of variables, we could do the change of variables t to t inverse. So this is the sum as t and gamma of beta t inverse alpha t. And now we see that um, this we can rewrite as the inner product of t delta e and then s star delta e, which is exactly s t delta e. Uh, so at least uh, when we apply this vector state of delta E times delta E, they can't tell the difference between T times S or S times T. Um, but now this actually gives us the full result because then, uh, so now if say X and Y are in gamma, let's look at T S delta X delta Y. Let's look at an arbitrary matrix coefficient here. And now remember T commuted with the right regular representation, S commuted with the left regular representation. So it makes sense to write this as uh, T S and now lambda X delta E and now rho Y inverse delta E. And then I can use the fact that lambda commutes with S, rho commutes with Y. And so now this and of course, lambda and rho commute with each other. So this is t, and now we're going to have uh, lambda x, rho y, s, delta e, delta e. But what do we know? t was in the commutant to the right regular representation. So hence, t times lambda x is also in the commutant to the right regular representation. S was in the commutant to the left regular representation, so rho y s is also. And so we're exactly in this situation where here we have a new t and a new s. So we can use this equality that we have from above and change the order of these two things. So this is now rho y s, and now we have t lambda x delta e delta e. And now we just move everything back. So this is S T delta X delta Y. And since X and Y were arbitrary, we get that therefore T S is equal to S T and that, uh, like I said before, hence the commutant of the right regular representation is contained in the bi commutant of the left regular representation, which was the group one. Right. That's kind of a fun little lemma. Um, all right. Any questions about that? There's a similar lemma uh, to this, which is that if you have a, any finite von Neumann algebra M, then there's a canonical representation called the standard representation. And there's a similar thing that says that the commutant, uh, you, are, you also have like a left multiplication right, and you can say the commutant of left multiplication is right multiplication. This, this is similar. Um, but this case for groups is pretty, pretty direct. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead now and prove the theorem. So proof of the theorem. Uh, so remember we had, maybe go back to the theorem. So we had three conditions which I claimed were equivalent. One is that a function is of positive type. The other is that it is a multiplier, a, a UCP multiplier. 
And then the, on the reduced groups you start algebra, and then the third is that it's a UCP normal multiplier on the group on the Riemann algebra. Uh, so let's go ahead and show, uh, how do I want to do this? Probably one, or we'll prove one implies two implies three implies one. I think that's how I want to do it. So let's prove first one implies two. Uh, this is pretty easy because we have uh, phi mapping gamma to the complex numbers is of positive type. Well, remember how that was defined. So therefore, the kernel, which took uh, from gamma times gamma, took entries st and mapped them to uh, I think before, so we want phi of, uh, let's say, S inverse T uh, is of positive type. Uh, I think before I might have put T inverse S, uh, but the inverse takes things of positive types to things of positive types, so that's not such an issue that I put S inverse T or T inverse S before because both of them will be the equivalent to being a positive type. Uh, but I want to put S inverse T here because then the multiplier will, will come out uh, to be what we want. Uh, so then what can we say? Well, we know that this is a positive type. So I can use the previous theorem and say that we have a sure multiplier, which is UCP. So therefore, the sure multiplier, uh, the sure multiplier, which was uh, m sub phi. So this was mapping b of L2 of gamma to b of L2 of gamma. And this is of, uh, is UCP. And let's go ahead and compute uh, what this sure multiplier is on uh, elements uh, left regular representation. So we'll go ahead and compute m phi lambda t, and we want to compute what this is. So this is going to be some, uh, some bounded operator. Uh, so we want to figure out what are its matrix coefficients. So we again take the inner product with delta x and delta y and just compute this. Uh, and then what do we see here? Uh, so this is uh, by definition, uh, yeah, so by definition, this is going to be uh, phi of, so this is the coefficient corresponding to yx. So this is yx up here, so it should be uh, x inverse uh, y, no wait, yx, so it's y inverse x. And then here we have uh, multiplied by the same thing, so lambda t delta x delta y. Right, but uh, this inner product here, this is going to be zero except when t is equal. Uh, hold on, this is still not what I want to get. So we have here, this is the coefficient corresponding to y x. So this should be uh, y inverse x. Uh, oh, I did my formula wrong again. I wanted this up here to be the same All right. So that's how I want to use it. So that way that we get here y x inverse. That's what I want. Right? Because now what do we notice is that this inner product here is zero except when t is equal to uh, y x inverse. Then it's one. So we can just replace this with phi of t, uh, and now maybe move it inside the inner product, lambda t, and then delta x, y, delta x, delta y. And that was true for all x and y, so therefore, what do we get? Therefore, m phi of lambda t is equal to phi of t times lambda t is true for all x and y. Uh, so what, what does that show? That shows that the 
sure multiplier given to us actually gives us this multiplier on the reduced group C star algebra, right? So it gives us a UCP map on, uh, it gives us a UCP map which satisfies this equation. And so in particular, that means it maps the group algebra into the group algebra. But since it's UCP, it's also bounded. So it also maps the, the closure of that into itself. So therefore this maps uh, the closure. So therefore this, the image of this uh, is contained in the reduced group C star algebra and in phi is UCP. So it gives us a UCP map from the reduced group C star algebra. So, uh, moreover, so uh, what's also uh, true is that uh, so this this map is normal? That's easy to do. It so it's this map right here is already a normal map. Uh, so that's easy enough to do because say weak operator topology um, uh, unbounded sets is exactly that the matrix coefficients converge to each other, which you can verify by hand. Um, and so what do we have here? So this is a normal map. And so I claim that it also takes the von Neumann algebra into itself. And so specifically what I'm gonna do is note also if, uh, I guess that's al already kind of clear because uh, it takes the C-star algebra into itself and is normal, so it takes the normal closure into itself. But another way to see that uh, is that if, uh, say, uh, T lives in the commutant of the right regular representation. So then uh, you just check, uh, let's go on the next page. Uh, so if T lives in the commutant of the right regular representation, uh, so then you can just check what is this M phi of T, uh, M phi of T, rho T or rho S minus rho S M phi of T, uh, delta X delta Y. Uh, and we already saw here, here you can add the row. And so this is just M phi T uh, delta X S inverse uh, delta Y minus uh, M phi T delta X. And then here we're gonna have delta Y S or yeah, Y S. And now this is, we already saw before that this is just multiplying by that coefficient. So this is just phi of y t inverse x. So it's this one and the inverse of this one, s inverse. Um, and then here we're also going to have a, uh, uh, sorry, this would be s not s inverse, y s x. And here we're also going to have a y s x and um, and the y s x inverse. Yes, yes, thank you. And here we also have a y s x inverse. That looks better. And uh, and then we're going to have inner product m phi uh, delta x s inverse delta y minus m phi of t. Oh, sorry, not no longer M phi of T, but just T itself. T delta X delta Y S. But now, again, you just rearrange this and you see that this is just the commutator of T with row S. And, and so you get that this is equal to zero. So since T is commutes with all right, so therefore, uh, what do we get uh, is we get that um, M sub phi maps uh, the commutant L gamma into L gamma. 
and that's the coming time to rho to the coming time to rho. Uh, and we already, again, we already know it's UCP, uh, UCP. Uh, so that shows, I guess, one implies uh, three. So we show one implies three and one implies two. And then to get that those imply one, uh, you use the Steinspring theorem. So conversely, if MV mapping, I'll just do it for the reduced group C star algebra. That works the same way for both. If this is UCP, well, this sits inside of V of L2 of gamma. So again, I can do Steinspring. Uh, so by Steinspring, there exists uh, H or K, H, we haven't used H yet, the Hilbert space. V, this uh, isometry, L2 of gamma to H uh, isometry. Uh, pi, this representation of uh, the reduced group C star algebra to bound up represent H star representation. And then I'm also going to use this uh, row. I don't want to use row because we've already used row. So let me use row tilde. So this is going to map the commuton. So that's R gamma to the bounded operators H such that M phi of A is V star I have A V and row tilde of some x, whatever it is there, b is v x, x and yeah. <clears throat> so what I can do now is I can um, actually give you, so this is the Steinspring, so now I can give you the GNS representation that corresponded to phi. Uh, so specifically, uh, we consider the representation Uh, of gamma on H uh, given by taking T and sending it to pi of lambda T times rho tilde. Now I see that my choice of notation was very unfortunate. Uh, rho tilde of rho of T. So these commute with each other uh, so this gives you a representation of gamma on H, and then we just compute uh, what is this inner product of pi lambda t rho tilde rho of t times V of delta E, V delta E. So let's just do this computation. And then we see that rho tilde, we can use this formula up here. So this is equal to pi lambda t v delta uh, v, well, it's rho of t, so it's delta t inverse v delta e. <clears throat> but now we have a, move the v there and we get v star pi v, but that's exactly the UCP map. So this is uh, m sub v lambda t uh, delta t inverse delta e. And m sub v applied to lambda t was exactly uh, phi of t times lambda t delta t inverse delta E, and we see that the T's cancel, and so we just get P of T. So since, uh, yeah, so that we have a representation, and here's a vector, and so this was exactly a positive type. This type was, hence, is V is a positive type.
Uh, and that works just as well if you just replace C of C, the reduced group C star alpha with L of gamma, then that works just as well. So we showed one is equivalent to two and one is also equivalent to three. All right, any questions about that? All right, so we'll do a similar theorem of this. So this was for positive type kernels. Um, but we'll discuss another type of kernels, completely bounded kernels, at a later point in the semester. Uh, but uh, we'll have to do a little bit of operator theory uh, before we're ready for completely bounded kernels. So, all right, I'll go ahead and stop here. Uh, there is a subfactor seminar that starts in 10 minutes. So if you guys are interested in that, I encourage you to come on by. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Monday. All right.